Hello and welcome to season three of Pakistanomy. It's been a while since you've heard my voice or watched me on YouTube. Um, I was away for the holiday break and figured that the end of the year was a good time to put a pause um, before joining you all in 2022. So this is episode one of season three. And we figured that we start this year's conversation by focusing on the politics of the political economy. And the reason being that 2022 is basically the year where every political party in Pakistan prepares for elections that are coming up in 2023. And everything from the ongoing debate around the IMF mini budget um, to the State Bank Autonomy Act to what happens with inflation, et cetera, will be viewed and informed by a political lens. Um, so to talk about what's going on in the political setup in Pakistan, especially in Islamabad, um, I have the honor of having Amber Rahim Shamsi. She's head of communications for the Bad Lab and also an award-winning journalist. Um, and Amber, someone that I regularly ping when I have a question around political developments in Pakistan. So Amber, thank you so much for taking out the time today and joining us here in Pakistan. You're welcome. And, and uh, the year begins with a bang, really, in Pakistan, um, a, a huge tragedy. Uh, in Mari, um, that obviously raises questions about uh, the PTI government's um, ability to govern, and uh, plenty happening, obviously, in the National Assembly on, as you said, um, the mini budget, and then moving forward, we have uh, the opposition parties planning marches and uh, no confidence motions. So we can begin. Yeah, so you, you set the stage right here, um, but help us parse through the noise. Pakistani politics, like politics all over the world, including here in the United States, is very noisy. If you're watching the 8 p.m. Geo, uh, if you're watching 8 p.m. Fox or 8, 8 p.m. CNN, um, it's a lot of noise that makes it very hard for the casual listener or the observer to parse what's exactly going on. So from your perspective, where are things right now and what are going to be the dominant themes of the rest of this year as we look towards, in my view, the first election, which is the November 2022 selection of the incoming chief of army staff, <laughs> and then everything goes on from there. Yes. Um, so to set the stage a little bit, I mean, I talked about events, but let's talk about uh, a big um, changes that were anticipated prior to um, the events that I briefly mentioned, and those are, um, as I said, symptoms of probably what's a wider disease. There is a degree of instability in this current political system. And just a little bit of the rocking of the boat, as we witness with October and the appointment of the ISI chief, um, has sent a few, I wouldn't say shockwaves, I wouldn't say that it's permanently damaged the relationship between the military um, and, and the Imran Khan government, because we must remember that one of the key features of this government, of the, the hybrid regime, was that the military and uh, the civilian government are on one page, unlike past governments and like past uh, opposition bar, um, um, political parties when they were in government, um, and that this would be a clean government. Um, so accountability is important. Corruption is, is, is important. Um, you know, as we may recall, October and the delayed appointment of the ISI chief um, really sent shockwaves. Um, but I think what's important here to note is that these will um, have an important sort of bearing on the November appointment of the army chief. And the year has begun, and there's been a lot of speculation already, including directly uh, from, from the prime minister himself. Um, a journalist met him, spoke about the appointment. Now, there's been talk within his cabinet as well. And there's a, there's a sort of defensive posture as well that's being taken. Um, that the relationship is as good as it was, um, that November is far is, is very far away, and uh, uh, the Prime Minister Imran Khan really hasn't thought about it. But really, I think that um, it, it's downplaying what will be a key pivot um, or will determine the course of politics throughout this year, 2022. We must also remember that it isn't just uh, the appointment of the Army Chief. Next month, we have a change of guard in the Supreme Court as well. And... Uh, uh, we have uh, judicial politics will also uh, throughout the year play a very important role and will continue to do so. And when I say judicial politics, I don't just mean Supreme Court appointments or who becomes chief justice, but bar associations, because uh, since last year, they've become very active uh, in terms of their resistance, in terms of filing petitions, in terms of making a noise, threatening, you know, uh, all, all sorts. So um, th those are the big changes. Um, we also have a series of local bodies elections, which which could be a sort of they're sort of a bellwether in the absence of proper polling. 
uh, to gauge the popularity or, or you know, um, as the case may be, the, the failings of the government or the unpopularity of the government. Um, we had one phase of the Khabar Pakhtunkhwa local bodies elections. The next phase is due in March. March is important, um, as it seems to always be in Pakistan, where March is a season of long marches, the weather turns, spring is here, um, you know, political instability rears its head again. Its head again. So uh, one of the main opposition parties, Pakistan People's Party, has announced a long march um, at the end of February, which is very interesting uh, because it's before the long march that has been announced by the joint uh, opposition platform of, of the Pakistan Democratic Movement, which is uh, primarily the two main parties are uh, JUIF, right wing, and then the PMLN, which is your leading opposition party in the National Assembly in terms of numbers and very, very key. Uh, so they've both announced long marches. Uh, there's increasing talk of in-house change and uh, no confidence motions in the National Assembly. Um, and interestingly, um, uh, a couple of things also to watch out for in terms of um, the Election Commission of pa Pakistan and the Pakistan TDK Insaf's um, funding issue, foreign funding issue, which is something that will be, will be continuing the Election Commission of Pakistan, and there will be a final judgment as well. Um, so important questions, the Prime Minister himself has said the next three months are important. So those are sort of the political developments to watch out for. Uh, but also we have to bear in mind that the mini budget is also due. You know, the talk in Islamabad, and I, and I tend to agree with it, is that it's unlikely that this will not be passed. But um, I think that what's important to watch out for is inflation and how the government manages that and, and uh, how its uh, popularity waxes, waxes and wanes uh, in, in, along with the you know, fall and rise of the inflation, because there's already a lot of dissatisfaction. Um, so, you know, that's sort of summing up the year to come, I guess. Barring unexpected events, which is a Murray tragedy. Um, yeah, yeah, I think the Murray tragedy sort of started things off on the the wrong foot, so to speak, for the government, right? In the sense that you had ministers celebrating hundred thousand tourists coming into Murray and saying, "What inflation? What poor economy? Look at how many people are coming uh, to enjoy the cold weather," and as it quickly became a tragedy, and there was an uproar. Um, I always question in terms of the ability of these strategies to sustain momentum when it comes to opposing the lack of governance. Um, it's been the case for years. This government is not unique in that sense. Um, so that's a question. But I think on the inflation part, it's important because we've already gotten indications from farmers and agricultural experts that the wheat output may not be as high as anticipated. And so the price of the commodity may go up in the market. There's obviously, uh, it links to the shortage of urea and fertilizer and the government is saying it's being smuggled, which then begs the question, um, where is it being smuggled to and how? Um, and the wheat question will con continue, right? It will continue that conversation on the inflation front. Um, I wanna touch base on sort of starting with the judicial sort of activism or judicial politics. Um, we've already seen the Islamabad High Court take a position on, for example, the restaurant in the Margala Hills, um, saying that this is not the job of the armed forces, et cetera. Um, how do you see the judiciary sort of under a new chief justice um, gearing up for elections? Because we've seen like, you know, in, in a weird way, Pakistan's superior judiciary at least has this um, uh, view that you have one activist justice followed by, you know, since if the car Chaudhary, if I remember correctly, uh, an activist one followed by somebody who doesn't like the headlines. Um, the current chief justice who's outgoing has been quite activist in his own way. Um, where do you see the judiciary going in terms of the fact that it is also a major institutional player in Pakistan's political economy right now? Yes, so um, I think that's a really important question because um, you know we're talking about November in terms of the uh, appointment of the army chief, but you know the first big change of this year will be the new chief justice, and even though um, his tenure will be only about six months or so, not not enough. I mean, if we're looking at elections to be on time, which is 2023, you know his tenure will end. Uh, but the next um, chief justice is due to be Atta Bandeal, and. Um, I think it's curious to see how his role will be, I think, especially because there's, there's going to be an important case coming up before him. The Bar uh, Association, the Supreme Court Bar Association, has, is filing a petition or has filed a petition, I believe, 
on um, uh, looking at um, um, Article 62.1F, which disbars politicians uh, from contesting elections for life. So, I mean, the two big examples are uh, Nawaz Sharif were, and, and um, um, Jangi Tareen, who are victims of this. Um, they were both barred from participating in politics uh, for life, um, from contesting elections for life. And there was a lot of controversy around the judgment as well. Um, this will be contested by, this has been contested by the Bar Association, which um, I, I might tell you has, has, become, has also has played a very uh, key role in terms of judicial activism, supporting, openly supporting a lot. Uh, for instance, Ghazi um, Faiz um, um, and, and uh, the petition against him and the, and the case against him. It's quite likely uh, that this will go before a full court. And the Supreme Court has also recently appointed, you know, and, and which has been great news, which is a, a female, uh, first for the first time in Pakistan's history, a female uh, uh, justice to the Supreme Court. Who So if it's a full court, she would be on the bench. The Bar Association's actually technically uh, had, had opposed her appointment to the bench as well, saying that the um, the process is not transparent; is it isn't based on 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 a, a due process. Um, anyway, so the point being that this is going to be an important case that could be coming up before the Supreme Court. Now, when you speak about the Islamabad High Court, um, the Chief Justice Arthur Manila is known to be progressive, um, and all of those things. And I find that his judgments tend to be very, very you know, given the cases that come before him, they tend to be very strategic. So, for instance, we see that there was one case that was before him, which was um, a, a, a newspaper or a journalist who published a story on uh, an affidavit filed by the former Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice of Gilgit Baltistan against the former Chief Justice Saqib Nisar, who played a key role in the Panama judgment. And uh, uh, Athar Minilla was, was very upset with the, with the publishing of that affidavit and, and actually reprimanded the journalists and almost uh, was ready to indict them in contempt of court because his, his point of view was uh, that it undermines the course of justice and the ju judicial process. Um, whereas I think that his recent uh, sort of judgments on, for instance, you've spoken about the park on Margala, which you know overlooks um, Islamabad. That's a beautiful tourist spot. Great Desi food there as well, and it's been there for years. Except unfortunately, so this is um, a land that that is rent is being given to the military. Uh, this is um, protected land as well. Uh, there's also been a, a, a judgment against uh, Athar Manila has also been given this judgment against uh, a club uh, by the na Navy. Uh, that that is another lovely, beautiful tourist sort of spot in Islamabad. Um, because it's been illegal, and it kind of echoes what the current Chief Justice has been doing, Karachi. Uh, with mixed results, obviously, because Nasser Tower, as we know, um, there's been there's been a sort of dual standard. Uh, we see that whereas Nasla Tower has been is, is being demolished, um, so have been lots of mosques as well. On the other hand, you've seen, um, you know, a, a, a hotel in Islamabad where where the prime minister and many important people, including judges, have, have flats was regularized, even though it was illegal. Um, and and the sort of um, uh, Bunny Gala, where the prime minister has his large palatial residence, um, is a housing society that's also but was also technically illegal and was also regularized. So I, I think it's an interesting um, where various uh, chief justices or justices will give different kinds of judgments, and I think that it is strategic. I mean, I can't predict. I, I won't say that I have an insight into how. Um, the next chief justice will deliver his judgments. I think there was a lot of, for, for instance, just to sort of give you a flavor of what I mean, um, before Saqib Misar became chief justice, there were a lot of people who were talking about his 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 proximity to the Nawazli family. He was their you know lawyer at some point, um, and and many had said that he was actually a very conservative judge when it came to his uh, judgments, except um, when he became chief justice, he he surprised everyone become by by sort of the other end of the activist uh, spectrum. In fact, I would say he was a, an extremely populist uh, chief justice along the lines of Iftikhar Chaudhary. And yeah, and, and this is basically what tends to happen with historically speaking with hmm. um, army chief appointments in Pakistan, right? Like successive prime ministers, including famously Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, made appointments of men they thought were closer to them or would be, you know, uh, at least subservient to them, if not close to them. 
Um, and it turned out that that sort of calculation was wrong. Um, and that is a decision sort of, you know, problem that has plagued prime ministers for decades in Pakistan's history. Um, but that's a whole separate topic. But I think you're right, the judiciary, at least my read on the most recent spate of judgments has been that there was a pushback after Nasla Tower. Um, we did a podcast on Pakistanomy last year on this to get a sense of this duality of, of uh, where one thing is regularized for the elite and where it's middle class or lower middle class is Gujar Nala, it's destroyed or it's, mm. it's you know, Empress Market, it's destroyed. Um, and I think that maybe led to a calculus strategically within the institution that they need to sort of now push back on the other end a bit. Uh, just to recover some of the some of the integrity that they have. I'm I'm speculating, but that was my read at least. Um, you mentioned the uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just I just also want to point out it really varies from Chief Justice um, and Court, right? For instance, uh, the the uh, late Vakar Said, who was the Chief Justice of the Peshawar High Court, um, was very active active in terms of the missing persons cases in in Khyber um, Pakhtunkhwa, um, but. I, I feel that Atar Minilla tends to tends to side with um, progressive values, liberal values, um, uh, a protection of, of fundamental rights. But but again, I, I do believe that he is strategic. Um, so really, it varies, and I think there's there's a couple of things that one needs to keep in mind in terms of when you're looking at how the Chief Justice may potentially um, deliver judgments and what kind of judgments he delivers. Is they are also looking to legacy. Um, you're right, there tends to be a balancing act. So, you know, activist, quiet, activist, sober, you know, it might be, but um, it also depends on, you know, who's at the helm in Pindi as well. Um, what leverage? I, I don't want to say more than that, but that tends to be what, what is discussed. There are independent judges and not so independent judges. It really varies. Yeah, no, totally. And I, I, I mean, I think that's something to keep an eye out on. One thing I want to push back on your bed, you mentioned that, you know, the local elections in KP were a bellwether and I, you know, read them as such, but then at deeper level, I've sort of looked at, you know, prime ministers like Imran Khan, uh, prime ministers like Narendra Modi, um, President Erdogan, Rodrigo Duterte, Donald Trump, um, they may have uh, a situation where their party may get beat at the polls uh, when it comes to local or state level elections. We've seen this happen in India, for example, as well. Mm -hmm. But the prime minister himself, when he is on the ticket, and these are all he's, there is no she except Sheikh Hasina, <laughs> but one can argue uh, on the one state system in Bangladesh uh, and its, its mm. capabilities there. But when these guys are on the ballot, um, their base turns out to vote. And they stand by their guy. Even, you know, right now is reading about Rodrigo Duterte. He cannot run for a second term according to the Philippine constitution, but he's still 70 plus percent popular, although his reign has been terrible for the Filipino uh, citizens. Um, so why is it that, you know, there's something different going on with what happened in KP and the local elections? And do you really think that this is a bellwether that all is not well? Like, help us understand or help the naysayer who's listening in and saying, you know what, when Imran Khan's going to be on the ballot, it's going to be a different situation. Look, um, you one can't deny that Imran Khan, as as is uh, the other populist leaders that you talked about, whether it's Trump, whether it's Duterte or, or Bolsonaro, or you know, they they have a cult as well. Um, they are populist authoritarians in one sense, but where and and uh, Modi, I think, is another example. So, I think what we could see when I say that it's a bellwether, it doesn't mean that it indicates what the next election will be, um, because as we know elections can easily be manipulated um, as they are. And, and there are there's many a, a slip between the cup and the lip. Uh, but I will say there's a bell that they indicate the popularity of a government or, or how people are perceiving it. I'm just giving you, giving you an example in the uh, local body elections um, around um, the, uh, the last tenure of the local bodies ended in 2019, in August 2019. Um, uh, the KP government was supposed to hold elections about 90 days, I believe, constitutionally after that. And they didn't uh, because, uh, and, and again, I got this from an insider, um, they were afraid of, of uh, inflation, the management of the economy back then as well, and, and put it off. And they had a very convenient, easy excuse in COVID-19, even though by-elections continue to be held. 
Um, and it wasn't until uh, court judgment that you know this election was held, uh, and you see the results of that. So which is also people, another weird thing about Pakistan's economy that you need the courts <laughs> to say when elections should be as like you know what just hold them on time. No, exactly. I mean, if you look at um, whether it's Punjab and the PMLN government, it really needed court judgments. Uh, it need, needed court judgments to to do the basics, such as hold have a census. Uh, I mean, um, and that's the PMLN government. Even with Sin, um, there's a, there's a obviously pushback in terms of the local body structure and and the Jamaat Islami, which is you know you you're from Karachi, so you you know better than I do, is is also establishing itself. Is really existing, but um, no political party or mainstream political party really wants to hand down power uh, to local bodies, which is why courts intervene and step in, because this is an, an entirely dysfunctional system. So when, when I say bellwether, I'm just going back to that point. How do you judge or gauge whether government is popular? There are polls, um, political parties hold them uh, through Gallup or Ipsos or other um, you know, um, um, companies that conduct these polls as well. Some they keep secret, some that are not, some that are public facing. But I think by-elections are a good indicator of two things, uh, public sentiment and also what the establishment, where the establishment stands. Um, so, for instance, if we look at the KP elections, not because the P uh, Pakistan Tehri Ke Insaf lost, um, but because we didn't see much direct in involvement and there was a general consensus, uh, perhaps an understanding that that hands off uh, let, let 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 the sort of um, cards fall where they may, which they fell in against it, you know, um, against the PTI. Um, and which are the, a number of various factors, of course, but I, I would say these two, these, you know, they give us a good indication um, of, of where the establishment is going and what in terms of support as well as public sentiment. Mm. One thing that came up to in conversations here in Washington after the KP local body selection was mm. concern about the rise of Jamiyat e Ulama Islam Fazl, right? I mean, mm. someone I was talking to said this seems a lot like uh, what happened under General Musharraf when the MMA came, and that was not a good time for Pakistan given everything that had happened in Afghanistan. Um, do you see any concern around the return of JUIF? Um, in these elections and their growing popularity with what's happened in Afghanistan? Or do you think that, you know, people in the West are overplaying that concern? Well, whoever I speak to and, and uh, journalists and, and politicians from KP, um, they they feel that the, the, you know, the success of the JUIF and the local bodies elections actually had less to do with Afghanistan and more to do with um, the anti-PTI stance that the JUIF had taken. Um, um, so when we talk about, I mean, I, I wouldn't say there's, I wouldn't say that there's a comparison, but for instance, if Modi continues to be popular, um, it's because the opposition is unable to put up a, enough of a challenge and that, that the opposition is fragmented. So state, state elections might lose here and there, and that really depends, but not at the national level. In KP as well, I think uh, the ANP has, has un been, been unable to place itself. Um, you know, it, it votes one way in the Senate, it goes one way in Balochistan, and then in KP, it, it, it has another sort of uh, stance. So um, I think the JUIF possibly, potentially, because it's been, um, you know, there, there is a, a conservative vote uh, in Khyber Pakhsunkhwa. And this is something that you've seen, we've seen post 9-11, but for whatever reason, I mean, you know, the MMA is one example of that. I, I believe, and, and there, there are several factors to explain this, but I think that um, uh, the conservative vote also went to the PTI. Uh, JI actually, J Jamaat -e Islami lost out on it in the 2018 elections, but, but it remains there and it had to go somewhere. And I think it went to JUIF as some kind of alternative. Speaking of the conservative vote, um, obviously 2021 once again showed us that um, all is not well in Punjab when it comes to radical Islamist polit political parties. The PLP once again flexed its muscles and we saw this level of schizophrenia with the government in terms of what to do about this. Um, where do you see the TLP going in 2022 and the 23 elections, um, given that it basically is patting itself on the back for a huge, tremendous victory last year 
where it forced the government to release its leader, not only release its leader, but if reports are to be believed, um, secretly flew their leader from Lahore to Islamabad to negotiate a deal, um, and a deal that still has not been made public. Um, what what is the sort of outlook for the TLP's power in the Punjab and including Karachi, because that's where they have a lot of power as well, increasingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the TLP's obviously is, is, is an interesting case study, um, given how it was born, uh, I would say, in the blood of, of, of what was considered to be a progressive party, which is the Pakistan Pe People's Party and Salman Dasi, and subsequent nurturing um, and, and empowerment by various, uh, I would say particularly, I mean, if you look at this, this case, it, it's happened before, the PDI government was completely helpless. Um, it, it, it played the sort of, there was a, um, it, it talked big and, and could do nothing essentially because it was helpless. As you said, um, Saad Rizvi, the um, head of the TLP was flown in. I think with the TLP, there's a, again a lot of, um, I would say that their lack of success in the in the uh, KP um, local bodies elections could be telling, but perhaps because the support base, um, the conservative vote bank perhaps resides more in Punjab and Sindh, as we saw in the 2018 elections. I think there's another factor at play here as well. Um, maybe the TLP could be a spoiler cutting down votes, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it could win bigger. It's, it's hard to predict at this point. It really depends on Saad Rizvi as well, because he's not his father. Uh, Khadim Rizvi commanded a great deal of respect and uh, within um, uh, these hard hardliner sort of uh, Barilvi circles as well. Um, is Saad Rizvi cut from the same cloth? It's, it's, it's um, I wouldn't say, I think that's, that would be another interesting sort of development in terms of how TLP fares in these um, local body elections, because let's remember there's, a, there's one in Punjab that's coming up as well. It isn't just the next phase of the KP elections. Yeah, and I think, I mean, as you were talking about that Saad is not uh, his father, I was thinking about my graduate class um, reading the Muqaddama by Ibn Khaldun, and the first generation usually is the warrior generation mm. that sort of commands uh, respect through its ability in, on the field of battle. And that was clearly his father. Um, and now it will be interesting to see what kind of a leader Saad is, right? Whether he can take the movement to the next level. I personally think there is no more need to have um, a Khadim Hussain Rizvi type speaker uh, to grow this movement. I think it's consolidated enough power. Now it's about, you know, reconnecting or broadening its connectivity with the mainstream um, in terms of getting votes out. Um, I saw this in 2018 in Karachi where upper middle class uh, people who were Barelvi um, in terms of their ideology were simply voting for this uh, party because they didn't like any of the other options and their thing was like let's try something new it was similar to what the PTI folks would say right like we haven't tried them let's give them no chance and some people made that bet on the TLP now the question is um, will more of these people make that bet on the TLP um, moving forward given that it has been able to show that it can go toe to toe right and in fact beat back the keyboard warriors uh, on the streets mm -hmm. when it comes to that because the keyboard warriors are all about fighting um, this group. Um, so it's it's a big question mark. No, I think I think what I've seen, um, so maybe Saad Rizvi is a little quiet and and, and uh, the TLP has been on the down row um, since its big success. But what I've seen is that it's actually consolidating in Karachi. So, you know, cleaning up Karachi, because we have to bear in mind that now, given uh, the performance of the PT at the federal level and its performance in, in Karachi as well, um, I, I don't know. There is still a gap that remains that the um, the MQM left, the PTI was unable to fill. Um, yeah. And I think the TLP is actually ripe to fill that gap. And they're doing it. They're doing it in Karachi. They're also, um, I've noticed, you know, playing an active role in terms of philanthropy, which is something that you see that the Jamaat Islami does, uh, for instance. Um, so, yeah, I think it'd be an interesting thing to watch. Um, there's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, very wary of making predictions. I'm no Sheikh Rashid in any any sense of the word. Um, but um, you know, I think that's that's a party that I would continue to watch out for, given given um, its success, given its base, uh, given some of the sort of um, uh, gaps or spaces that are being left by mainstream parties. 
Yeah, and I think from an organizational perspective, right, in a weird way, um, right-wing parties in Pakistan, especially religious right-wing parties, mm-hmm. tend to be far more organized at the grassroots level through the madrasa and the mosque networks. And TLP is an example of that, right? I mean, you can go to Fazan and Medina uh, every Thursday and Friday and just see how many people turn up. That's an engaged base uh, week on week, um, you know, hearing the ideology of the group and having the networks. And so it, it's going to be an interesting time to watch out what they do next. Exactly. So, I mean, on that note as well, I think the the sort of, uh, of the combination, the reason that that the PMLN, for instance, needs JUIF um, on, on the PDM platform is because they're able to command people just like that. You saw that uh, TLP also was able to do it from all parts of Punjab. You know, suddenly they're there. It's because they're committed, driven, um, faith-based um, devotees, which political parties with, uh, you know, um, varying degrees of ideologies and mixed um, um, mixed groups can't command. This is just not possible. They don't have that discipline. Yeah. Speaking of the PDM, and obviously the People's Party is saying it's going on the march, and the PDM is saying it is also going on the march, and they're trying to align their calendars, and it seems like it's not <laughs> working out so far. Um, but one of the things that, you know, folks like myself have always criticized the opposition when it's in opposition, including the PTI, is that while they can do the agitation politics, they don't do the rigorous homework that helps them prepare for government, right? PTI is a key example of that, where it's sort of shadow finance minister for years, as Sadomar uh, was in and out uh, from his job as finance minister in a hot second. Um, and that begged the question, well, if you were shadow finance minister for so long, what kind of preparation did you do for the job itself? Um, and in fact, he was a parliamentarian, right? So he had access to the data at the committee level, et cetera, to prepare better than somebody who was completely on the outside. Um, we're seeing something, at least from my position, um, seeing something similar with the opposition parties is that while they're all about Imran Khan government has failed, it's corrupt, inflation, et cetera, et cetera, um, we don't see a lot of creative thinking in terms of what they would do to solve these problems when they're in power. Am I mistaken or do you sit from your vantage point, see the same thing where, you know what, the level of deep rigorous work that needs to happen to govern better um, is not being done by the opposition today? No, I think you're absolutely right. And that's a fair criticism um, on the opposition party. So if we if we think of the Pakistan People's Party, which is, you know, is, is bidding for um, for federal uh, in the next elections, whenever they would happen. You, you mean bidding um, for federal selection or election? <laughs> <laughs> selection, selection. It's all about the selection in Pakistan. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, they're, they're priming themselves. So when you think of the Pakistan People's Party, who do you think of in terms of finance minister? What what is their, um, uh, what is what what are their solutions to the current crisis? Well, let's not think about what they did when they when they came to, into power in two thousand and eight. With several finance ministers also changed, right? Um, and, and interestingly, you know, it's it's something that's obviously been a bit a bit of a joke where um, the PTI government has had the same finance ministers as the Pakistan People's Party did. So what could possibly be different um, with the PMLN? Um, again, they bank on Shabash Sharif, the bank on uh, on the growth rate, and we know that this this didn't work out well either. It was the same boom and bust cycle, the same return to IMF uh, in the end um, that the uh, that we'd seen in other governments as well. So. If you question them about what the potential solutions are, they'll, they'll speak about very, very, I think, in fact, I would say even go as far as to say that, you know, um, very knowledgeably about certain sectors. I think the PMLN has a lot to say and a lot of good things to say about energy and what to do about it um, and an admission of mistakes as well. But when you look at solutions, who, who wants this kind of economy? What do you do with it? And, and that's what, one of the reasons why I suspect Expect um, when we talk about inflation, um, the Pakistan Tariq and South government would not like an election this year because there's constant speculation about early elections, for instance. Um, and I think at the moment, is that speculation coming from the government or from the op- where is this spec? Because I've heard the same speculation. I'm like, why would anybody, whether you are in government or in opposition, want to go to the polls? If you're the government and you go to the polls, you're going to get a drubbing. If you're in opposition and you go to the polls, you're going to probably win and have to deal with all of this mess. So in either way, why? who wants early elections? <laughs> 
Look, I mean, um, I, I don't know about DC, but Islamabad is conspiracy central. Um, uh, it, it, this is uh, Pakistani politics is dis dysfunctional and, and almost, I would say, um, psychedelic. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, psychedelic, schizophrenic, whatever you, however you want to describe it, because there's some things that seem to be unbelievable when they happen. You, 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 you can't understand this would happen in a normal country. I would give, an, give the example of, for instance, the, the uh, IG Sin being kidnapped, uh, you know, um, in the middle of, of um, from his residence uh, when um, Captain Safdar was the husband of Mariam Nawaz, raised some slogans at, the, at, the, at Jinnah's tomb. But I mean, what I mean to say is that it's it, this is an odd country and 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 really just ripe for conspiracies and speculation. So the at the moment in Islamabad, there is a feeling of things are unclear, but they're not hunky dory. Let me go back to that first question about twenty twenty two. What is the alternative uh, to Imran Khan? Um, what system? Uh, would provide some kind of political uh, stability or would satisfy the PPP or the PMLN or whoever wants to come in power? Uh, what would Imran Khan's reaction be? Um, so this, this question of early elections, it's a tool that Imran Khan has and as uh, you know, it, it is a tool that Imran Khan has in his hand as well to dissolve the assembly and call early election. It, it, it's a power that he has. Um, the other option is I, I would I, I my sense is that uh, none of the main opposition parties would like early elections either. They would like a runway period uh, so that whatever is happening in, in bubbling in terms of the economy is somewhat sorted um, by a caretaker or perhaps a nationalist government or whatever, you know, whatever form it takes. The Constitution, obviously, that there's no there's no option for nationalist, um, you know, a national government. Um, sorry, I meant to say national, not nationalist. Um, but there is obviously an option of, of a caretaker government, uh, but that's also very for a very short period. So this is why we, we see a lot of speculation that something needs to be done, something needs to change. Politics is not working as it is. Parliament is dysfunctional. Um, the, the polarization, the inflation, you know, this is just not working. But how to fix it? I, I suspect that there's no answers for that. Help me understand this, though. When, when people say in Pakistan, it's not working. I get it if like when I go to Karachi and I talk to my maid or my driver or the corner guard and catch up with him or her, um, it's not working, clearly isn't, um, know that directly. But when people in Islamabad or in the corridors of power in Islamabad, Rawalpindi, Lahore, Karachi say it's not working, my question is what isn't working? Because if you're looking at things from their perspective, and I'm, I don't mean just the PTI, I'm looking broadly speaking as the elite, as the core group of that holds the reins to power across systems and institutions in Pakistan, things are pretty good. So where is this from your perspective, this angst about things not working coming from? Because if you've been an elite in Pakistan since 2018, you've gotten an amnesty, you've gotten subsidized access to credit, you probably imported a couple of Audi uh, EVs uh, on cheaper rates because the government reduced the duty on that for electrification, mm -hmm. um, quote unquote. So where is this gripe coming from? Because it's something that's been a question of mine that I want to discover and think about and, and ask people about in 2022, because I don't understand where the problem lies when everything is hunky-dory for the elite that are actually in power. No, you're absolutely right. Um... We've see, recently seen uh, Pakistan uh, buying a bunch of um, uh, really pretty sort of hardware uh, uh, planes and such. Um, there have been appointments that have been beneficial. Uh, as you said, there's been amnesty schemes. Um, um, Even the Americans are gone from Afghanistan. You know, like <laughs> you, have con you have like the quote unquote strategic debt, which some say was never the yeah. intent, but okay, mm. it's there now. But, you know, I mean, um, where's so on the face of it, it should seem like the it's working for the elite. You're absolutely right. But I, I, I mean, um, I, I, I probably don't have any more clear answers to this, answers to this. But there is there is a, 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 a dissatisfaction that runs through when it comes from. Um, sure, I mean, if Fawad Chaudhry says that, you know, a lack of people went to muddy, um, there's no doubt about it. If you sort of go out on the streets in, in Islamabad, you know, cafes are, are, are full, 
uh, people have nice cars, they're buying, you know, SUVs, all of those things, the inflation doesn't affect them so much, the electricity doesn't affect them so much. But if you go, if politicians go into their constituencies um, and there's no money to give, um, it is something is, there is a disconnect, it isn't working. So the other, I would say that power politics has a lot to do with it. Um, what isn't working is obviously this relationship and, and new appointments that are coming up. Um, how will Imran Khan assert himself, for instance, um, against um, what, what has been a, a, a... Okay, let me sort of rephrase this. So I think power politics isn't working as well. Um, it isn't as if the Pakistan People's Party and the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, who may have failed in terms of agitational politics, um, absolutely they have, but they're also talking to the military establishment, aren't they? I'm not saying that there is a deal in place, uh, but um, the reason that they, they are talking is because the relationship between the um, Imran Khan government and, and the military regime isn't, isn't as... Um, isn't on the same page as it was pre-October 2021. Um, so I think there is some kind of discontent um, within the middle class, and, and I would say upper middle class as well, um, because a lot of the centrists or people who may not be cultist supporters or you know, worshippers of the Imran Khan, at the Imran Khan uh, um, uh, altar, but who are also cognizant of the fact that you know, this this isn't working. So there's two kinds of discontent, I think. Um, one that that is within power corridors and, and one that is within people. And you can't completely deny it, uh, no matter how 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 cozy or privileged your life uh, lifestyle is. Yeah, I think the, uh, even, yes. even 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 uh, dictators um, had to conduct some form of elections, you know, if they didn't want to um, had to had, you know, public opinion matters to everyone, even, even the elite, even the military establishment, which, which has a very active and successful uh, public relations machinery. Um, so you can't, um, um, I think the last few years, given that this regime has been tagged as hybrid, given that this has been about, it isn't just a, civil, a civilian government, but if, if there's any failure, it comes back to the military as well. So I think all of these factors would, would tell you that, no, all is not well. Yeah, and I think in sort of my narrow lens is always on the economy. So the way I think about this is that they inherited a bad situation. Um, it got worse mm -hmm. and they haven't been able to get a grip on it. So uh, if your spokesman is tweeting that the martyr is 20 rupees a kilo because there's <laughs> the harvest just came in, uh, it's not going to have the necessary impact. And then that in a way creates the sort of initiates the cycle of distrust within the power corridors because there is issues with the constituency level things and questions are asked and instead of dealing with the actual issue that is causing uh, your attention then diverts towards dealing with these issues within the power corridors which then means that the wheat crisis happens or some other money happens or something else happens and i think you're right or as like, you think, pointed out or as you pointed out i think those the fertilizer um crisis and smuggling. I mean, it, it sort yeah. of also is, is, is similar to what happened with sugar. Uh, yeah. We've forgotten that sugar was smuggled out of Afghanistan. Um, yeah. And there's, there's already talk about uh, fertilizer being smuggled out of uh, Afghanistan as well, despite there being a fence. Um, you know, obviously nothing came of that inquiry. I mean, I, I can't think of anybody who was, um, um, you know, um, was, was um, prosecuted for smuggling sugar nor do I think this will, will it happen in this case, but I think it's telling. Yeah, and I think the wheat thing is coming down the pipe and what I've been flagging to folks is that, yeah. you know, if Pakistan misses its wheat output, expected wheat output by 10%, and then has to go into an international market where Russia is looking at Ukraine and Kazakhstan is in problem, mm -hmm. um, wheat prices are already high. India may miss its wheat market uh, output as well. Um, and so all of a sudden you have two big buyers coming into the market and lo and behold, we're the weaker economy in Pakistan. And also we're next to Afghanistan, which is facing its own humanitarian crisis, uh, which means that there will be more demand for wheat um, in that country. So the incentive to smuggle the product out of Pakistan into the Afghan markets will also grow. 
Um, and that's a question that people should start thinking about, but we're not because all the other issues you mentioned are also top of the table in terms of the agenda items that needs leadership focus. Um, so I think there's gonna be a lot more um, volatility uh, when it comes to things like this and the outlook is not great um, in terms of the headlines coming out for the PTI. Um, I want to conclude um, this by, you know, you mentioned there are obviously things you can't predict. Um, and if you were to pick like a good and a bad surprise, um, and I know you don't like to predict, but it's something that's exogenous that may ease the situation for Pakistan and its people or make it worse, like what, what would you want to keep an eye out on when it comes to exogenous factors? Okay, um, a good thing or a bad thing. I think um, the situation in Afghanistan uh, throughout this year um, as um, you know, the humanitarian crisis remains, um, we've already seen uh, you know, a, a bit of a tiff, I would say. I wouldn't say it's become full out, full, full, a full blown sort of um, hostility as it was with the Ghani government, but there has been a bit of a tiff along the border. We've seen as well um, uh, the, the TTP, the, the deal with the TTP falling through, things like that. I think I would, in terms of exogenous factors, and I think it has a deep impact on the economy as well. So smuggling, um, we, had, we, we saw some uh, dollar outflow to Afghanistan as well. Um, so these are factors I think that I would, look out for these could be potentially bad for Pakistan not to mention I wouldn't say the escalation in terrorist in incidents or attacks on on the military um, will have a wider impact on on all of Pakistan but but they remain factors uh, that need to be sort of looked out for what are the sort of positive things that we have to look out for I when, when you say uh, in terms of uh, exogenous factors I mean I <laughs> maybe I'm 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 not too positive. I'm domestic politics being as volatile as they are. I, I can't think of anything that that I hope there is some good news um, on the, econ the, uh, the economy front. Um, I suspect that obviously that the mini budget will get through, as I said, and that would uh, would wouldn't be a bad thing because we do need that tranche of the IMF loan. So perhaps that is something that could be positive to look out for. Yeah, I would say like, you know, my my positive is, and I've said this last year as well, that if I'm the prime minister, I'm probably praying five or more times a day for oil prices to come down to below 50. Mm -hmm. um, and that might be the best sort of exogenous good news that he could hope mm -hmm. for in this year. And that might ease a lot of tensions that he's currently experiencing as well. Mm -hmm. But that's, again, not under anybody's control. And if Russia has its way with Ukraine, exactly. who knows, we might be north exactly. of 100. So exactly what I was going to say that right now with, with global politics being what they are and Russia, um, and uh, I, I think it's just very hard to predict at this point. Uh, like I said, nothing is easy to predict. Yeah, or the Iranians decide that a few more drone attacks on some of the oil facilities is what's warranted as a <laughs> New Year surprise. But you're right. I think there's not a whole lot. There's a lot of uncertainty in the global economy. And I think Pakistan mm -hmm. is going to feel sort of the second and third order effects of that uncertainty, which is a shame because the economy is already in a, in a weak place right now. But before I let you go, um, book recommendations, I see there's a collection of books behind you. Um, oh, so yeah. any two or three recent ones, any topic that come to your mind, uh, please share with us. And, and you notice that they're not even facing the right way, which is something that I get yeah. um, um, a lot of flack for, by the way. Um, it's just pure laziness, to be honest. I know we need to reorganize. Um, all right. I mean, I think, um, so I, I read a lot of fiction, by the way, um, and possibly because I read a lot of nonfiction as part of my job. Um, and besides, I just, you know, I just love nonfiction and what it does and take, transporting you into new worlds. So I would say just read the Terry Pratchett Discworld series. There's a lot of politics there. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's great writing and um, it's very relatable. Um, you know, I, for instance, I'm reading about this, uh, the one of them that I, I was currently reading and I read several books at one time is called Interesting Times. And it has, um, it has interesting insights into, into, you know, Chinese culture, for instance, um, dressed as, as a fantasy. Um, one book that I read last year that really stayed with me for a long time was a 2020 Booker Prize winner. It's called Shuggy Bain. It's been written by a Scottish American first time writer. Um, and it's about this uh, young boy working class Glasgow um, and his, his, how he dealt with an um, alcoholic mother. Um, you know, great, great, just brilliant writing, really um, 
it's actually very painful to read as well um, at the same time as, as because it's a coming of age story is also great uh, heartening I mean I, I would say that as dark and bleak as it is it most throughout the book it does brighten up a little bit at the end but I think that's a it's a great under it's, it's a you know in terms of relationships and parents and and how do you um, how do you become how do you deal with adults when you're a child um, you know addiction all of those things i think that's great i i've just recently also finished amara lee john's book um rule of fair um and uh, eight pieces on authoritarianism and the solution the way forward uh, i would highly recommend it for anybody who wants to understand the structure of politics in pakistan um i think just a couple of things on that um he speaks a lot about general dyer um and, and how you see many manifestations of him throughout uh, Pakistan's history, uh, you know, Jallianwala Bagh and all of that. But, but I think just the fact that the Pakistan seems to be in a permanent state of emergency, and we've discussed this throughout this, uh, this, this session as well, that 2022, and again, um, it's hard to find the good. There's, there's all kinds of, of um, 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 uh, points where you could see things turning for the worse or hardly for the better. I don't know. There's, there is constantly a state of emergency, whether it's an ex whether it's external or internal, uh, and that's partly because politics itself is is quite um, in, in Pakistan centers on power elites um, rather than people, um, and and that dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction or, or it finds expression in ways that perhaps you know, for instance, the TLP. Um, I think. Um, which, which again is is a is 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 a, is a sort of right wing turn to politics that perhaps progressives would not like. But anyway, um, so I think you could, one people should read that as well. Um, yeah. And I would say just Hilary Mantel, she was a British author. Uh, her series of books on Oliver Crum, uh, or not uh, sorry Thomas Cromwell, um, who was the key figure in uh, Henry VIII's reign, fiction, uh, very dense. Um, really beautiful series uh, and it's it's a, it's a long series i mean it's three parter but i think the last one there in the light is the sort of thickest of the lot um, but his role his rise um in um uh, the 1500s uh from from nobody to one of the most important men and power players in 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 um, english history at that time as well um bringing down a queen and boleyn for instance is uh, so uh, and and um, so I think that that's a, that's a great series to read as well. Thanks for those recommendations. I've been meaning to read Rule of Fear by Amar and have him on the podcast to talk about it as well. I've heard great things and I agree with you. I think I, I sort of switched to fiction after reading a little bit of nonfiction. And mm. what is great is like really good fiction connects with politics and political economy mm -hmm. at the individual level in so many ways. And yeah. uh, it's, it's yeah. always fun. Like I, I read... Um, half of a yellow sun over the holiday break yeah, um, which was about nigeria and as i was reading it i was like okay the british <laughs> left the same sort of challenges um in in in, in nigeria as well um so you know it's so, so uh, on, a, on a personal note by the way so i grew up a, a part of my childhood was i grew up in nigeria um and and the similarities uh, um you know are, are sort of mind-boggling as well yeah, um, yeah, the split between the north and the south, um, uh, militancy, a dictatorship. Obviously, the one big difference is is uh, oil reserves and gas reserves and corruption uh, because of that. But but I think there's just a yeah structures, yeah. The structures and also and also the super nice mansions that its elites have in London. So I think that yeah, <laughs> unites us as well. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's another thing. I mean, London will continue to be the center of politics in an odd way. Um, in Pakistan, and it seems to be um, in yeah. this year as well. Well, thank you so much for taking out the time. I think this is a great sort of overview as our first episode in terms of what's around the corner in Pakistan. And I think that's sort of going to be the recurring theme in this year is uh, elections are around the corner. Everything will be viewed from that lens, um, both in government and outside. Um, and to all of you tuning in, welcome back to Pakistanomy. We're going to resume in a way normal service on more wonky econ conversations. But I think as we move along this season, um, politics will be a bigger theme um, just because that's where the action is in this year and coming forward. And there's a lot of political developments which 
directly impact the economy. So Umber, thank you so much for kicking us off for this season and hope you have a good rest of the day.